Good morning, everyone. Um, I wanted to welcome you all to this panel discussion on a very important and hot topic um, for developers in the space and also the multi-stakeholder community on accelerated approval, catalyzing advancements in the cell and gene therapy space. My name is Nimi Chena. I head the global R&D and reg policy team at Biomarin, and I'll be moderating and chairing this session. And I'll invite my panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Virginie Egeman. I'm Chief Regulatory Officer at Tessera Therapeutics, a genome editing company based in Boston. Hello, everyone. I'm Fran Gregory. I am the uh, Vice President of Emerging Therapies at Cardinal Health. I am a pharmacist by training, and I am located in Ohio. Thanks for attending. Hi, I'm Kern Simpson, Chief Operating Officer, Regenix Bio, located in Rockville, Maryland, and we're an AAV-based uh, therapy company. Nice to meet everyone. Hi, Nicole Verdun. I'm the director of the um, Office of Therapeutic Products at FDA. Great. Thank, thank you all. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize that we have Dr. Verdun on the panel today, and she will be presenting on accelerated approval. We'll start with a background presentation to kind of set the stage of where we are. Um, and as I welcome Dr. Verdun to start her presentation, I just wanted to share my thoughts um, on having her spotlight introduction to the community yesterday. Uh, I don't know how many of you were able to be here in the room for that. Um, you know, she truly did come across to me as a visionary and someone who has hit the ground running uh, in the very short time that she's uh, been leading the office. Some of my takeaways from your spotlight introduction yesterday were you want to impact change in a meaningful way. That phrase kind of stuck with me. And uh, for those folks who may not have been here yesterday, um, you wear many hats, uh, mom of four and a practicing physician, and now leading OTP. Um, so you spoke on work-life balance on the last question, which as a mom myself, I'm, I've taken it to heart, which is control the chaos. Exactly. <laughs> Both at work <laughs> and at home. Uh, so thank you for that. And with that, I'll invite you to sure. give your slide presentation, please. Thank, thank you. you. I'm not, okay. So um, thank you, everyone. I um, am happy to be here. I was asked to just uh, give a few slides of just background on what accelerated approval um, is, that what the actual pathway is. And so that's what I've, I've provided here to sort of frame the, the conversation. So there is the, the US approval standard. I want to just start by, by having a conversation about, that, about what that standard is, because it doesn't change with the accelerated approval pathway. And so we really have to meet the bar of substantial evidence of effectiveness, which is, which is described in the Code of Federal Regulations. And this includes reports of adequate and well-controlled investigations to provide the primary basis for determining whether there is substantial evidence um, to support the claims of effectiveness for new drugs. So this is not something that we can, you know, we can get around in terms of that standard. So what are the criteria for accelerated approval? So you have to have a serious or life-threatening disease or condition that you're treating. And substantial evidence of effectiveness is based on an effect on a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit or a clinical endpoint that can be measured earlier than irreversible morbidity or mortality. So that is reasonably likely to predict an effect on irreversible morbidity or mortality or some other clinical benefit. We do take into account the severity of the disease, rarity or the prevalence of the condition and the availability of a lack of alternative treatments. And we also have to take into account um, residual uncertainty and how much there is. A large piece of the accelerated approval pathway are confirmatory trials. And so post-marketing trials are, are required to verify clinical benefit. So we have to be able to, um, to conduct those trials. The goal of these trials is to address the remaining uncertainty of surrogate endpoints in relation to clinical benefit. And I can just go right here and look. <laughs> so, uh, the dis so we have to have some, uh, some discussion on, prior to approval on the plan and whether these confirmatory trials are feasible. Some of the challenges that we hear in the rare disease space in particular in completing confirmatory trials really need to be addressed. And some of that is the timing of the start of these trials 
and the population. So if you can imagine, if you have a rare disease where there are 11 or 12 people total in the United States, um, that can provide some challenges to then do a confirmatory trial. And so this might not be the pathway for, for some of those things. And um, confirmatory trials showing no benefit may result in removal um, from the market. So it's something to just note. I do think that there is a space for, for accelerated approval. And um, the science inherent in the development of many of our gene therapies potentially facilitates the use of biomarkers um, as endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And some of those things that we see are enzyme activity levels, structural protein levels that can be measured and correlated with clinical endpoints. But accelerated approval is not for every gene therapy. Biomarkers are sometimes difficult to correlate with clinical benefit. And as I just uh, pointed out, sometimes the confirmatory trials are difficult to conduct um, or to complete. And so with that, I will turn it back over to the panel for discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Verdun. That was really helpful in setting the stage for what I'm hoping would be a robust uh, conversation on accelerated approval. And I was, as I was prepping um, for this panel, I, I went back and looked at, you know, what has FDA leadership or CBER or OTP leadership, um, you know, said about accelerated approval and use on the cell and gene therapy space. And I went, um, in my research, I went back to the joint statement issued in January of 2019 by then FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb and um, CBER Director Dr. Peter Marks. They issued a joint statement that's publicly available on the FDA website, where they also cited some predictions on numbers. Some of those were in Tim's slides yesterday on um, approving 10 to 20 gene therapies per year by 25. And, we saw that we are getting close to that number. And in that same statement, they also expressed use of accelerated approval pathway as a faster route to approval for new treatments, including potentially curative benefits where there are significant unmet medical needs. And of course, as you can imagine, you know, statements like this shows FDA's uh, willingness to support the use of accelerated approval program and you know create a buzz in the field, of course. Uh, and that was 2019 January, and fast forward to this year, in May of 23, um, Dr. Marx spoke at the ASGCT um, annual meeting um, in LA, um, and um, he spoke on, on various topics, of course, but he also spoke about new OTP leadership uh, coming into place. I think he was, the, the search was active at that time, and he, he shared his vision a little bit about, on that. Um, and he also spoke about accelerated approval, and, and the fact that the agency does now have more teeth um, in, you know, for example, as you mentioned in your slide, having an agreement on what the confirmatory trial looks like in a pre-planned fashion. But he also spoke about uh, the new leadership to lean in more on, on the willingness to support the use of this pathway in a responsible fashion, of course. So with that background in mind, I have a question for everybody as a starting question, but I'll start with you first on, on really the title of our session which is what are your thoughts on using accelerated approval program or supporting the use to facilitate advancements in the cell and gene therapy field? Anything beyond what you've shared in your uh, presentation already? Thank you. Yeah, I think that um, accelerated approval, I think, is a, a great pathway to, to use. As I, I pointed to, you know, from my vantage point, I just, it needs to be the, the right fit. So I do think that in some spaces, with the, in, in the rare disease space, um, traditional approval can be just as, um, you know, as, as welcoming for a specific um, indication or a specific uh, uh, therapy. And so I just think that it, it, because of some of the requirements that I outlined, I personally would like to get to a space where we're not only using accelerated approval. You mentioned that a lot of people um, have, um, would really, would really like to use accelerated approval in terms of expediting development. I also want to do that on the traditional approval side, expedite development. And so, um, and so I, I do think that it's a tool that we are certainly open to um, for, for the right therapy with the right biomarkers and, and or the right surrogates or intermediate clinical endpoints that we can use. Um, but I, I would like to sort of find ways to, to to expedite things in general. So that's my thought. That's very promising. I would think if, if, if we have a choice between accelerated approval and full approval, of course, 
um, going for full approval does uh, make a lot of sense from, from many angles, definitely. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll switch gears to Karan, if, if you could uh, share your opening statement or thoughts on how accelerated approval could help facilitate advancements in the cell and gene therapy field, and if you could expand on your thoughts on how expedited program designation, such as RMAT designation or breakthrough designation, could further help support a truly pre-planned accelerated approval path where the level of evidence required for approval is thought of early in development. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think of this uh, just reflecting on yesterday's uh, presentations as well, uh, that this is really just creating a dialogue. And um, for things like RMAT approval, which we have in some of our programs, we work at least half of our programs are in rare or ultra rare disease. Uh, what we're really looking for, and I think what I heard uh, yesterday as well, is let's have a dialogue about right. the most efficient path to approval, whether it's accelerated or whether it's traditional. And I think for us uh, as a sponsor, uh, what's been really highlighted in the last, um, I'd say, year or so is the need to think through the confirmatory study simultaneously with the approach to the accelerated approval. And so, we intend to use vehicles um, like interact meetings or uh, uh, RMAT designation to have those dialogue. And I think what we're really looking for is let's be open about it. Let's not trade uh, letters or emails to each other about what we want that can protract time, but let's have a conversation about what the best path is. Uh, and it's all ultimately in the best interests of patients that we go as quickly as we can. I think that's the way we're, we're thinking about this. Great, thank you. Thank you, Karan. And maybe I'll shift my uh, gear to AV and invite you to share your opening thoughts on how accelerated approval could be used to catalyze development in the cell and gene therapy space, and if you could expand on that um, with your thoughts on the 21st Century Cures Act statutory provision to support use of real-world evidence to meet the post-approval requirements to confirm clinical benefit when RMAT designated products receive accelerated approval. That was a lot of words, but hopefully you can break it down for us. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nimi. Um, and thank you, Arm, for putting this panel together um, and for Dr. Verdon to join us in person. It's greatly appreciated. Um, so what does good look like for accelerated approval? If we look at all the gene therapies that have been approved so far, um, I think there's only two that have received accelerated approval. So there is room for using this tool a little bit more. Um, so I have four remarks, but I think the, the first point is probably one of the most important is that I think for accelerated approval to be successful, ideally, it would be something that's pre-planned, that's discussed in a proactive manner early on and potentially after you receive RMAT or breakthrough. Uh, you're supposed to have a multidisciplinary meeting with the agency, and I think that's a good time to start thinking about what does your pivotal trial look like? Are you going to use an intermediate or a surrogate endpoint? Um, what would your confirmatory trial look like at a high level or your use of real-world evidence? Um, and then that dialogue can continue at end of phase two, and then I think at pre-BLA that needs to be quite mature at that point. Um, and I think it's good practice as well to start your confirmatory trial before you submit your BLA if you're using that path. Um, and as you mentioned, Nimi, within our designation from, uh, in the statute, there is a possibility to leverage real-world evidence instead of doing a confirmatory clinical trial. Um, I think very few people have been able to do that so far. I think the key there is um, to encourage collaboration with patient groups and ensuring that there are robust registries. Um, that can be a challenge, particularly in the orphan uh, space, but either you know, sponsors conduct their own registries or they can participate to existing registries. <clears throat> you know, sort of the poster child there is like the cystic fibrosis uh, registry that companies can leverage. So I think, to me, that always made sense for uh, rare diseases and for gene therapies where we had to follow patients for 15 years um, with integrating vectors. So I think that's something that people should try to think about and discuss with the agencies. There's pros and cons about the quality of the data, but I think it's uh, important. 
Um, and I think ideally the spirit of AA is, is not to sort of uh, retrofit that at, you know, during the BLA review and, and sort of deciding that at the end of the BLA review. However, we do understand that sometimes there are new data, uh, sometimes delayed adverse events that happen in our field that can impact the benefit risk assessment and where the agency then may want to leverage uh, uh, accelerated approval, but I don't think that's the original intent. The intent is to accelerate the development. Um, and so I think that's what sponsors and the agency need to think about. And I think sponsors, when they come in after their RMAT, they should say, well, if I follow an accelerated path, we could get approved here. And then if it's a full approval, we could get approved here. And what's that delta? Because if it's a few months, you know, you said it yourself, Nimi, or maybe a year. Well, maybe it's not worth it. Uh, and that will probably be my third point. But if it's several years, um, and depending on the severity of the disease, that can be that can be really meaningful. And I think then both the agency and sponsors can be aligned on moving forward. Um, so that's, I think, important to try to be proactive from the sponsor side to kind of show that path. Um, and then I think a little bit of the elephant in the room is sort of price reimbursement issues. Why are there differences? Uh, I don't think we want to go into depth in this, but that's something I think that in our ecosystem needs to be discussed more, um, as well as um, a quick plug on the fact that if you accelerate clinical development, well, what about your CMC? Um, and the FDA has initiated a pilot called CMC Development Readiness uh, Pilot um, that is supposed to uh, help define tools that will help with that. So I think that will be a nice complement to leveraging accelerating approval uh, in our field. So hopefully it will be a win-win for everybody. Win-win sounds good, and those were really helpful points. You, you touched on a lot of things. CMC, of course, needs to keep pace with accelerated clinical development, especially in programs that are um, designed to leverage the accelerated approval program and hopefully get to that through that clinical development sooner. Um, but one point that you made also was on ensuring uh, patient uh, engagement and, and input on that. And so maybe I'll, I'll shift gears now on that, and picking that point to Dr. Gregory, if you could share your thoughts on how accelerated approval uh, can help facilitate development in cell and gene therapies, and especially earlier patient access mm -hmm. to those uh, with unmet needs. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think the accelerated approval pathway is a, uh, a great opportunity to get um, treatments to patients with rare diseases sooner. So when I think about the accelerated approval pathway for cell and gene therapy products, I'm thinking about a couple of different components that kind of feed into that. Um, first and foremost, like Dr. Virgin mentioned, um, it, it's not for every product, right? The accelerated pathway is not for every product, and any product is free to, to apply. Um, these rare diseases um, present a very unique challenge to the clinical trial setting. So if you think about the accelerated, accelerated approval process, the intention and the goal is to get these products to patients more quickly, more, um, more expediously, and uh, m you know, more standard, a more standardized approach to getting products to patients uh, more quickly, even though these products are extremely non-standard, right? They're for very small patient populations. So a couple components, one is the time, right? The time that it takes to get a product approved with a full approval is, uh, could potentially be, like AB said, it could potentially be a lot longer, but it could be a shorter period of time. If you look at the 300 plus products that have been approved through the accelerated pathway um, so far, uh, some of those products have gone from BLA to, to accelerated approval in as, as little as one and a half to two months. So it, it's a huge advantage to uh, the time period that it, it could potentially require to get these products to patients. So I think the time factor is, is the number one thing. These patients have often no other treatment options. So um, when we're seeing a benefit from a surrogate endpoint that has been defined and agreed upon with the FDA and the sponsor, it is, um, it's critical that you know, we are expeditious in getting that uh, review and that approval complete so that patients can access these products. The second piece, in addition to the time, is the kind of the, 
quantity and the quality, and they kind of go hand in hand, right? The quantity, we don't have an N of 500,000 patients here. We sometimes have an N of tens or 100 patients um, to evaluate an endpoint on. So looking at that from a more flexible viewpoint, which the accelerated approval pathway allows, really allows us to be able to show um, potential clinical endpoint benefit and clinical benefit with these surrogate endpoints. Now, not every product that has gone through accelerated approval, unfortunately, has accomplished full approval. Um, some of those products do not, um, do not validate the, uh, the clinical benefit. So what we want to see is we want all of these products to uh, show a clinical, meaningful clinical benefit to patients. So selecting a surrogate endpoint that is a meaningful surrogate endpoint that really does um, have a high robustness as it aligns to the potential clinical benefit is extremely important too, and it's critical in these patients when we are dealing with such small populations. So in summary, you know, the time to getting the, the product to the patient is facilitated through the accelerated approval pathway, as well as the second piece, the quality and the quantity with the low patient numbers and the more flexibility within the clinical trial design with the surrogate endpoints. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts there. And emphasizing the quantity and the quality aspect of it going beyond um, the nature of the endpoint as well. And maybe I'll, I'll go back to Dr. Verdun for my next question. And while I do that, I'll also note that there is an opportunity for audience questions. Um, so if there are questions, don't feel shy uh, and you know bring them up. And I think I have a first question coming up already. And while the mic gets to you, I'll pose my next question to Dr. Verdun. Um, you know, just noting that there are over 7,000 rare diseases and only 5% of them um, by data by them, some, some analysts have uh, treatment options. So there is a huge unmet need out there. And I, you know, I do understand and absolutely appreciate your thoughts on supporting full approval when we can versus accelerated approval, but underscoring the unmet need that, that remains out there. Uh, what are your thoughts on collectively industry and, and regula regulatory and patient community, collectively improving communication early in development um, to align on a development path with the endpoint of choice, be it surrogate endpoint or intermediate clinical endpoint, for more regulatory predictability, especially in areas that are unprecedented or have uncertainty associated with them. Yeah, I think that the communication piece is is extremely important, and I think that some of the you know initiatives that we have that are outward facing are the start pilot. But just the I mentioned that because I think that the spirit of that is what we need to expand. I mean, I would just like to add you know the some of the the things that the issues that we deal with with accelerated approval is. There's okay, so there's a there's a conversation about a biomarker and a decision, and that to move forward with that biomarker, and then the data comes in, and there's significant another thing that just hasn't been mentioned that I will add. There's significant heterogeneity in a lot of these rare diseases, like in terms of just um, how severe it is in a, in a particular population that's already very small. And so then you know you have a trial, and um, out of the 11 patients, two of them showed effect. I'm being honest. This, these are the things that we see. Two of them show effect. Nine of them don't. Um, and the the baseline, just in terms of of uh, baseline symptoms, clinical severity, sort of all over the map. So these these are sort of these are conversations that it, communication is definitely key because we have to have conversations around that. Um, and, and what does it look like? What does the confirmatory trial look like? What does data that's coming into the agency that, that, that has that actually, I mean, how, how can we leverage that or what can we use to sort of get to the finish line? And so I think to your question, yes, communication is key. We're figuring out ways to, um, to, to move that communication a little bit earlier on. And, um, and I think we have to have continued communication through the life cycle of the, of the therapy. Thank you, that's, yeah. that's very helpful. I, I often give this analogy when looking into real estate, it's location, location, location. Mm -hmm. And when developing a drug in communication to regulators, <laughs> yeah. it's communication, communication, communication. So thank you for underscoring that. I'll move to the gentleman here up front. Please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Mark Fulish, Seattle Endapa Therapeutics. 
I'm really encouraged by the comments of Dr. Verdun and the rest of the panel being very supportive of accelerated approval as a continued avenue for earlier patient access. That said, there's a number of voices out there that are suggesting that we should continue to raise the bar on the data required for an initial approval. So there's, for example, a project optimist, well-intentioned, but even advocating for randomization early in development to really understand dose and schedule. There was recently uh, an editorial in the New England Journal stating uh, by some academics that they felt like the new draft guidance on accelerated approval did not go far enough, that, that really single-arm trials for approval should be the exception, the rare exception and not the rule. You know, for somebody who's been doing cell therapy for cancer for more than two decades, like every development plan that I've ever put together or, you know, as a company been a part of or advised has included accelerated approval as an early value inflection point. And my concern is that this very kind of ivory tower sounds very well intentioned, but the, the consequence of that is that there's going to be less funding for novel innovative therapies. And we'll have very, you know, we'll have greater confidence in the, maybe the therapies that get that initial approval, but we'll have less of them, right? And I think an appreciation that development doesn't stop with that initial approval, right? And I think a lot of this is bred out of the lack of sponsors fulfilling their post-approval commitments. And I think right. we're all for, like, ensuring that, you know, supporting the FDA, uh, you know, to uh, enforce those things, but that, you know, there are registries, there's, there's, uh, there's confirmatory trials, there's opportunities to answer these questions after the initial approval. But I'm very concerned about, you know, these numerous voices kind of pushing for raising that bar. And I just wonder if Dr. Vudin and the rest of the panel have any comments about that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that there, the balance with accelerated approval, as you said, is um, there's a significant history there at the agency of its use and where it, it doesn't work and where it does. And so there are those voices out there. I do think that um, there also has been conversation at the agency recently of just the accelerated approval pathway. It's, it's not the same for all drugs, biologics, vaccines. Um, and we have to sort of look at those buckets a bit differently. And there are places in there where we have to have more flexibility than others to answer the, the question. But I, I think that, yes, that is um, a, a definitely a barrier to, to innovation. But I think on the agency side, we are sort of looking to, to look at some of those things differently um, based on what we're, what we're treating and what the therapy therapy is, but we have seen some, you know, some concern with, with um, some of the things you outlined. Thank, thank, thank you, you for the question, and thank you, Dr. Verdun, for taking it. That's a nice segue to my next yeah. question, and maybe I'll bring it to you, A.V. Um, you know, FDA has been clear in affirming um, that the standard for approval, for accelerated approval, is not diluted or otherwise compromised, and the agency's approval standards are maintained for the program. Can you talk a little bit about guardrails in place? to ensure the safety and effectiveness for products that receive accelerated approval? Yeah, I mean, I think when you go through the approval process, uh, whether it is for full approval or through accelerated approval, there is very little dif difference. And I think the, the, the rigor of the review um, and overall the standard um, is the same. I think the difference, as we just talked about, is you, for accelerated approval in theory, it's based on an intermediate or surrogate endpoint um, that you, where you will, that's likely to predict uh, clinical benefit that you will confirm a little bit later. Um, so I think uh, the, the process is, is there. Um, so, I mean, maybe you can say a little bit more about what you think about in terms of guardrails. You know, when I think about guardrails, I think about the fact that um, their FDA has new authorities in place now. For mm -hmm. example, um, the expectation to have a plan for the confirmatory trial to be mm -hmm. in place at the time of approval, to be able to remove a product from the market if the clinical benefit is not confirmed. Um, and, you know, reaffirming that the standard, standard of approval is maintained for these products, and it's the same set of clinicians or review teams looking at these products as well as those that receive um, traditional approval. Yeah, and, and I think that gets to the question that was asked a little bit before, right? It, it's up, uh, upon all of us to try to use the accelerated appro approval pathway uh, the right way mm -hmm. and try to have these discussions early, try to reach agreement, and hopefully the data will support that. And I think as we see one or two or three products that are actually able to do that, 
there are challenges related to accelerating the development. Um, but if we are able to do that, able to leverage real world evidence, I think our field will benefit and we'll get to a place where products get to patients earlier, which is what we want. Um, but I think it will take um, proactive engagement from sponsors with the agency, really mapping out that development pathway and maybe think about a, a few scenarios early and then try to reach agreement on what that what is that path um, and having success, success there. And then I think that we'll uh, follow with other products little by little. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those thoughts. And I'll, I'll shift gears um, and pose a question to you, Karen, if I may, on how do you think we can make this pathway more operational? Are there development cost considerations to keep the rare disease drug development going and avoid funding from drying up in this space that you want to bring out here in the panel? I think there's a, a couple of ways to look at it. Uh, when I think about accelerated approval, you know, some of the things that I think we can do to evaluate risk is to bring a really strong preclinical package that supports the biomarker that you've chosen. And second to that, a really mature CMC process that um, has been used in a platform approach in other programs that might be similar. So two ways to de-risk maybe the lower level of, of, of safety data that you can bring in that situation. I think leveraging program to program is, is critical because um, if you look at the capital markets right now and the ability to, to fund rare disease research and development, uh, we have to be really, really efficient with that process and we have to be able to leverage um, one program to another, especially if they're both in the same space. And so those are the type of things that it's really hard to figure out when you do all of that, where the true savings are. I think we're, we're, that's the conversation that we want to have. Is it that you avoid tox lots uh, being run on every single program with the same serotype? Um, or is it that you can do process characterization once for multiple programs that use the same platform? So I think those are the areas that in the next couple of years we really should explore because that's the way to reduce the cost of drug development for these ultra rare diseases where they're quite frankly very difficult to fund. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that uh, thought there. And um, I, I do want to move to the room and see, scan the room if there's a question, if there's a pressing question before I move on to next one. So while the mic makes your way to you um, here in the front row, uh, maybe I'll move to Dr. Gregory, for a question on, on your thoughts on validating surrogate endpoints to support full approval and also your thoughts on use of intermediate clinical endpoints to support accelerated approval. And how do you really think about should we go for full approval, should we go for accelerated approval? How, where, how do you think about it? Where in the process do you think about it? Yeah, this is a, this is a, a big question, right? Um, and really it gets to the crux of the need for the accelerated approval pathway. Um, again, I kind of go back to a few, um, a few key points and those are, um, you know, how do, how do we really get these products to patients more quickly but ensure safety and clinical efficacy? So I think that it goes back to the robustness of that, of what, whatever that endpoint is that you're going to select as your endpoint, it needs to be clearly defined and it needs to be very closely tied to that clinical endpoint at the end of the day and that outcome that the patient benefits from, from the therapy. So it's very important to think about the end, <laughs> in the beginning of your process and defining those endpoints, whatever they may be. Some, some uh, endpoints are very specific to acute, uh, rapidly progressing diseases, right? They're easier to measure overall survival or very clear um, morbidity and mortality endpoints that are very clinically significant. However, other endpoints are longer term. We know it's critically important to uh, help these patients with slowly progressing chronic diseases that will, we know will lead to morbidity and mortality. So that's where we really need to lean on surrogate endpoints so that we can ensure these products do get to patients, um, you know, before a 10 or 20 year time period of clinical trials post, 
post uh, development. So, um, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into what is the endpoint that we're going to measure, whether it's a surrogate endpoint, a clinical endpoint for full approval, or an intermediate endpoint for accelerated approval. Um, it really depends on the type of product, the progressive nature of the disease, as well as what type of uh, therapy and how that therapy acts within the body. And then, of course, again, to being tied back to the endpoint, whether it's surrogate or clinical, and, and that has to be a relevant endpoint, and it has to be very closely tied to the, to the benefit for that patient. Thank you. Thank you for that. And really, no one size fits all. Exactly. It depends on the... I just wanted to add maybe one quick thing that um, I think sponsors also struggle sometimes with the fact that you're supposed to use a validated surrogate endpoint if you go into a disease that where very little development has been done. Um, if it's going to take you a long time to validate the surrogate endpoint, well, it sort of defeats the purpose. And that's a conundrum that perhaps we collectively need to talk about more because I don't know how, exactly how to get out of that. Um, but perhaps that's where maybe regulatory flexibility can help depending on, on the disease. Um, but that's an important point when you Thank think you. about your surrogate Thank you, endpoint. Evie. Thank you, Evie, for bringing that point um, from the question out on, on validating the endpoints. And if I may build on that question, and if you will give me a few more minutes to get to you, <laughs> you know, another question I had for Dr. Burdan was, you know, FDA has made um, publicly available the table of surrogate endpoints, yeah. which is uh, super helpful to have an understanding uh, across the landscape on where an endpoint has been used to support full approval, to support accelerated approval, and what indications. Um, it, it's, it's a great tool. And first, I want to congratulate and, and thank the agency for making that publicly available and, and maintaining that. And I just wanted to get your thoughts from an OTP perspective on how sponsors can leverage that tool or any other tools um, that can help the field think about endpoints, surrogate endpoints validated or, or not? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think that we, are, we would be open to using endpoints that are validated, and that's one place where people can, can go. But what I often see is, um, is that it, the, for some of these ultra-rare diseases, they, they're using endpoints that are not validated or not in a table or not something that, um, that has been used before. So. Um, I mean, my thoughts on it, yes, I think that that is a tool, if, if it fits your program, to certainly be able to use something that's validated and, and listed. Um, we also have a biomarker qualification program at the agency. But um, as you said, those things take time. And um, so I do think, again, it sort of comes down to uh, just very specific conversations around the, the development of the particular biologic that we're talking about. But we're open to using all of those things and all of those tools. Yes. If it fits. <laughs> yeah. If it fits, that's It that's doesn't really, always fit, though. Yeah. That's the bottom <laughs> line. No, no one size fits all or right. no one endpoint fits all programs. But that, that's a great tool. And you mentioned the biomarker qualification mm -hmm. program. There's also the rare disease endpoint advancement program that we're also um, looking at from externally. And all these efforts led by the agency will hopefully add more endpoints to that table. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we also find helpful is you know, the listing of or whether it supported full approval or accelerated approval. And as Avin yourself mentioned, over time, the surrogate endpoints get validated and yep. they can support full approval. Uh, that, that's helpful to keep the field forward. And I'll, I'll get to the question here. Please introduce yourself as well. Thanks. Yeah, hi. Ben Deweys, Kyverna Therapeutics. We talk about accelerated approval for, and we're targeting on endpoints uh, for efficacy, but could we talk a little bit about the safety side of it? Um, how much of that, if you're going to pre-specify for accelerated approvals, you're going to not just be looking at your efficacy endpoints, but you've got to look at safety as well. So in your experience, how much are you discussing that when you're, when you're talking to the agency on the front end? How much of it, how many products do you see get tripped up because of the safety instead of their, their perfectly designed accelerated endpoints, um, if you could discuss that. Yeah. Do you want to take Me? it off? Okay. Um, <laughs> so safety is also important, and it's also a challenge. I think with the, um, in the ultra-rare disease space, we often don't have a, um, a large safety cohort to, um, to be able to, uh, to, to truly um, assess that the risk. So in that, I, I will say that the benefit-risk uh, consideration pl 
play, comes into play. So if we have um, something where there are zero therapies available and, um, they, and something that's showing a, a decent amount of, 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 of benefit or a surrogate that's reasonably likely um, to predict that, I think that we are um, more inclined to, uh, to, to not have as large of a safety population. Um, in something that has no other treatments or no other. So it, it really comes down to just a balance of the data and what we have, but, um, but safety is something that's definitely um, a concern, a consideration. And we often will use, um, in, just for the example that I'm using, in the post-market space, um, PMCs to to sort of just make sure that or post market commitments to make sure that we're um, following and ad and addressing that those gaps that we have um, from uh, just just balancing trying to get something to people sooner, but also realizing we still have to get that data as well. But safety is definitely a consideration in the in the whole equation. Thank you, thank you for that question. I don't think we touched on that um, aspect of safety, mm -hmm. ensuring safety yet, but it, it, it is obviously um, one of the default uh, things that the agency would think about. I'm just going back to my agency days and you know that's, that's a given, but you, you raise a good point and do others on the panel wanna respond to question or build on Dr. Burdan's thoughts on ensuring safety for products moving through the accelerated approval program? Yeah, I'm happy to add a little bit of color. So, I mean, I would say in general, it's always about the benefit risk for approval. So that equation is important, but the agency has approved products that had, um, with accelerated approval, that have a safety profile with delayed adverse events, which is sort of the terminology uh, for gene therapy. Um, so I think, it's really about that benefit-risk balance, and I think the agency can, can see that, um, as Dr. Verdon just explained. So um, I guess it's going to be really hard in our field to have completely clean products, right, that have absolutely no safety issues. Um, so I think it, it's very important, and I think that's why the long-term follow-up for particularly integrating vectors will be really important. Um, and then as we learn collectively, maybe that long-term follow-up can be reduced for a class of products when we learn more. Um, and then also correlating CMC key quality attributes to the safety profile of these products. You know, I think we're gonna learn a lot over time. Um, so I think that just has to be part of the, the dialogue. But uh, you know, my, I guess, key message there would be um, that just needs to be part of the equation. It's not a showstopper to begin with. If you have issues, you just need to look at the whole picture. Yeah, and, and maybe building on Dr. Verdun's thoughts on that and AV's thoughts on that, I think I would just go back to the opening statements for this session, which is FDA's standard for safety and effectiveness does not change if a product has accelerated approval or full approval, the, the safety and effectiveness standards remain the same and the expectation of data as far as safety is concerned remains the same. I think it is how you get to approval. Is it based on a clinical endpoint that is known to uh, predict clinical benefit or confirm clinical benefit? Are you using an, an endpoint um, that can predict or that is known at the moment? Um, and I think that's really the differentiating factor, not necessarily safety. Um, to just am amplifying and emphasizing that, that but, earlier but I, point. I do think that um, a commitment to follow-up is, is, is key because I've, you know, one of the things that you just said to ensure safety, it's very difficult to ensure, right, yeah. safety. Yeah. And I think that for a lot of these novel products, um, it, it, it might take some time um, to, act, to actually follow patients to, to get some of these answers. Um, and so that's a, a key piece that, that's something that we, we also talk about at the agency is um, the commitment to long-term follow-up um, and so that we can truly see what, what's, what's going on with some of these novel therapies and these are things that we don't have sometimes at the time of approval. So I think that's important. A absolutely, and especially for long-term effects. Yeah. Um, that, that is key. Or just unknown, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I, I think that plays a little bit into the drug development strategy, though, because many times for a new indication, we think about, oh, there's this fancy new capsid that we want to try in the clinic. But if you think about it, if it's not really five times better than sticking with the capsid where you have a safety database already established reduces that risk as well. So I think as we consider candidate nomination for a new program, that's something that really factors heavily into our decision making. But that's a good point. And the safety and toxicity profile hopefully builds over time if you yeah. co continue yeah. to collect data um, on that. Um, I just wanted to scan the room so I don't miss uh, any pressing questions from the audience. Okay, there's a question here. Thank you, Bob. Please introduce yourself for the audience. Um, Bob Petrusco from Poor Bio. I have a question regarding uh, the patient advocacy and as well as the parent advocacy uh, regarding the value in meetings with the agency and also within the company de determining those endpoints, and also the uh, safety evaluation and what risks the patients might accept and how useful this might be in discussions with the agency and moving forward. Thank you, Bob, for that question. Thank you so much for that question. That, that was uh, one of the next lasting points I wanted to get on the panel, which is importance of patient input and engaging with patients and patient advocacy groups and getting their input into the development program, including the endpoints you're selecting and their, their thoughts on it. Uh, maybe I'll invite the panel to, to respond to Bob's question. Any, any takers to go first? I guess I'll, I'll take this one. Um, I think the patient advocacy groups are really critical. You know, I know um, from, from my experience working with advocacy groups, they really create the awareness and they can even influence healthcare policy very uh, effectively. I think that the interesting thing in the cell and gene space is that these, you know, these patients don't have any other hope, right? This is like their one chance at goal to get to a cure or get to a better life. So when we think about the balance, you know, we keep on saying it's a balance, the safety and efficacy risk benefit, it really does come down to is that patient going to get a clinical benefit from this drug? Is their life going to be better with this product than it was without it? And you know, the FDA has a really difficult job to do with these rare diseases because you just don't have the type of clinical data and the type of robust clinical trial design, you know, randomized controlled clinical designs are not necessarily a thing here. So, um, you know, the FDA has a really difficult decision to make and I know that patient uh, input is a piece of that, but also it's the emotional piece of it, right? There's the science piece and then there's the emotional piece. This is the hope, this is the future for their, you know, the, the parents speaking on behalf of their children or the children, you know, growing up with a disease that's uh, detrimental to their function or their life. So I think there's the emotional component and that's really where the advocacy groups come in and it's extremely important because there might be a very high risk tolerance for these patients that need these treatments. Um, and then the FDA has the hard job to, uh, to do to determine whether or not that risk benefit is something that is tolerable to the agency and, and to the larger healthcare population. Dr. Verdun, did you want to respond to, to this question as well? Um, sure, I can, and I can give a slightly different perspective. Um, I think that patient advocacy is extremely important. The patient voice, extremely important. Um, and, uh, and we consider that as well. And we have you know, patient-focused drug development programs um, and meetings, um, and, and it's an extremely important piece. Um, with the caveat, I think that sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes there's blurred lines between patient advocacy and, um, and, uh, and sponsors. And so I'm just being honest. Um, and so just in terms of, um, of, of, of where, where one starts and the other begins. Um, and so I do, but I do think that, you know, in the, the sort of independent voice of a patient and a parent um, and their experiences and what's meaningful to them in terms of outcomes, um, that's extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, so I, that's, yeah, I would answer it that way. Thank you, yeah. thank you. And uh, you know, you, what, what you said, I think I it relate to it with understanding the burden of the disease, the mm -hmm. burden of the available therapy, and really building on Dr. Gregory's points as well, what risk patients are willing to take, are they willing to go where the sponsor right. is willing to take the program or, or not, mm -hmm. and 
the, the savvy of the patient advocacy groups has been so impressive. Yeah. Um, they sometimes know so much more about the disease um, and, and can really help inform the program. I, mean, I, I think to just add sort of a little bit to what I was saying, we have the difficult task of making sure that what we're approving um, has benefit. And, you know, and I think that, that, that sometimes that can be a tough conversation, um, and, and especially in, in situations where there's not a, a lot um, on the market or anything on the market or um, where, you know, just the, the hope of, of, of just that this is going to be that, that thing. And so I think that there's, um, there's balance there, but I do think that, the, that the voice of the patient is extremely important in the conversation. Yeah, I think it's also very important, particularly when you design your, your clinical trials, right. I think making sure you take that um, into account. And I agree that groups are more and more savvy, which is fantastic. They understand a little bit more of the regulatory and development uh, process. I also feel that here at ARM, we've often talked about um, our duty to educate um, the patient community and working on very novel gene therapy products. Um, such as in the genome editing field, I think we need to continue to do that um, and, and engage with them. And I, I wholeheartedly agree that the independent voice is, is also important. So it's great that FDA allows that mm -hmm. um, separate from companies. Um, and then there's been trials to have, uh, when you have product specific interactions with the agency to bring patient representative. I, I haven't seen that happen too much. I know, in, for example, in Europe, that's done a little bit more. Um, so that's maybe a little question mark about, you know, what do we think about that? And would that be helpful? Absolutely. I think in, in what, what I've heard on that, especially bringing patients to the FDA meetings, sponsors want to do it, patients want to do it, the agency wants to do, do it as well, uh, having patients in, in, in those meetings. It's just that the agendas for typically the type B and C meetings become so long right. and, <laughs> and heavy. and and METI that giving a patient um, in the meeting adequate time to share their experience um, needs to take a unique approach. And I, I, have, I do have hope from the new type D meeting uh, under Padupa 7 uh, to be maybe hopefully able to provide that opportunity for a dedicated meeting on, on sharing the patient experience or perspective in a program specific manner. Um, we are um, about seven minutes to the end of the session. Just wanted to scan the room for any additional pressing questions. Otherwise, um, I will move to invite the panelists to share uh, their takeaway. We've discussed a lot in this discussion. <laughs> We've discussed um, endpoints, surrogate intermediate clinical endpoints. We've touched on CMC considerations for accelerated clinical development. We've discussed safety, benefit risk patient input, um, there's, there's a lot to digest here. Maybe I'll invite you all um, to share your key takeaway on what we collectively as a community can do to facilitate effective and responsible use of this accelerated approval pathway to help expedite development and approval of promising and transformative therapies to meet unmet needs. And more predictability in the development program if possible. Uh, maybe we'll start from my sure. left here with Avi and make our way down to Dr. Verdun. Sure, I'll try to keep that brief. But um, for me, it would be great if we could get to a point where everybody has sort of the same understanding of what accelerated approval is as a regulatory tool. Um, that would, again, be a win-win situation, win for the patients, win for the sponsors, but hopefully for the agency as well, where there is an efficient path. Um, and sponsors and, and FDA have a fruitful, uh, efficient dialogue. Um, and that should span, again, the, the entire life cycle of the product. And um, I, I don't know if at some point it makes sense for OTP to think about issuing, you mentioned bulleted guidance, for example, and that may be too much, but some vision of how accelerated approval can be used and, or should be used um, in an ideal state. So. Uh, Again, trying to get to this common understanding. So I think we need more dialogue. I, I guess that would be my, my uh, conclusion. More dialogue. More dialogue on this to, to make sure everybody understands it the same way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. 
Yeah, um, I, I truly appreciate the intent of the accelerated approval pathway. I appreciate all of the efforts that the FDA makes to try to get um, medications to patients, especially for rare diseases, in new technology like cell and gene therapies uh, to patients. So is it perfect? No, nothing is perfect. And it's really difficult to get to even a standardized approach when you have such small patient populations in you know, many of these diseases uh, have no other treatment. So we're really looking at endpoints, whether surrogate or clinical or intermediate, we're looking at endpoints that we've never looked at before for any other condition. So we're learning together. And I think the, you know, one of the key points that I think about when I consider the, the entire pathway to, to getting to an approval, whatever that type of approval might be, is early communication with the FDA and really taking the FDA's advice as to the direction in which they suggest that you should go, whatever that might be, whether it's you know, clinical trial design, whether it's accelerated versus full approval, whether it's um, measuring an in intermediate endpoint, CMC manufacturing, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, times the uh, CMC component is something that can be extremely challenging with these small numbers of treatments that we're manufacturing. So there are so many different components that go into this, but I think the, the bottom line for me is that we're trying and we're working together to try to make this process more seamless and to make this process something that will get treatments to patients and save lives faster. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gurvey. Go, go ahead, Kai. I work in operations, so I, I try to look at it simply. And, and I guess what I'm looking for and what I've learned today is is a predictability level mm -hmm. that when you go to uh, end of phase two meeting, it's really a snooze fest for everyone and everything's kind of laid out the way you'd like it to be. That would be the perfect world for me. Um, but I think, uh, you know, when I think about accelerated approval or traditional approval in gene therapy, we're still figuring all of this out. It's not all wrapped up in a bow. And are we learning from each approval such that sponsors that are working in the same indication area can learn from that and, and not sort of gnash over what the safety database should be for this type of indication, that there's kind of a standard set as we go along. And I realize there's always nuances to that, but the more we can make this predictable and a kind of standard process, then the faster we're going to go, whether it's traditional or accelerated. Yeah, thank, thank you, Karen, for bringing out the predictability aspect of it. And Dr. Burdan, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, invite you to share your um, takeaways on this, building on Karen's thoughts as well on predictability, but also, you know, keeping your earlier comments in mind, they come to my mind that, um, you know, in a trial for 11 patients, you, you've aligned on a biomarker and then you look at the data and two of them respond and, and rest don't. So how, how do you ensure predictability in, in the face of uncertainty? Right. No, I, I, th I think that just closing remarks, I mean, we're, we're definitely open to the accelerated approval pathway. Um, I think that, you know, another thing that just hasn't been said is just having a lot of just robust um, conversation and thought about endpoints is important and maybe leveraging more than one endpoint, like co-primary endpoints or, or mm -hmm. key secondary endpoints so that you have multiple sort of pieces that can that you could use to um, to make the argument for benefit I think that that also helps um, but I think that there is significant uncertainty sometimes and we have to sort of weigh that um, in the setting of of, um, of the disease that we're, we're treating um, so I would say communication is key a lot of thinking out of out of the box and um, and uh, you know, partnership for, for to bring some of these things to to um, to closure. Thank you, thank you for those closing thoughts, emphasizing communication. Mm -hmm. Partnerships are key, definitely, and thinking out of the box, yeah. um, keeping the indication, the the patient community's voice, um, and not that one size fits all. Um, we are less than a minute away, so we, I'm happy to say we're ending on time. Um, we were the thing between you and lunch. There's one so. more. There was a question, but I don't My know. My bad. If time. We, we have time for a question, please, she, if we can have the mic help. there. It's right there, yeah. So, my question is as it relates to uh, the accelerated approval pathway, most of the cell and gene therapies, the, you know, they're the first of its kind, but if there's already one existing in the market for that particular indication, 
but the product is the same classification, different platform, different approach. Um, if, are you bound to, I, I wanna hear just the thoughts, I'm not looking for a specific answer. Are you bound to the same surrogates that the, the previous therapy that has been approved um, has, has done in their application, even if the, the surrogate markers that you are using are just as predictive? Um, just because it's an accelerated approval pathway that you're also aiming for. And you know, this is something, I, I'm from uh, a consulting from Boyd's Consultant, and we see multiple of these cell gene therapies, and we're always saying, okay, do we just stick with what the previous sponsors have done, which is the easier pathway, but then the science is backing, the characterization is there, we have enough validation, and we say, okay, do we try challenging the previous uh, surrogate um, and, and do we you know, use what we have? But uh, again, as it relates to the accelerated approval, because you want to be fast, you want to get the accelerated approval. I'm sure this Good is a case-by-case, case, but um, I guess what comes to mind on my side is even if you wanted to use another surrogate marker, I would encourage you to keep the one that's been used before. Um, simply because if there's precedent, there's knowledge based on that, I think that's going to be helpful. And it's better to have uh, several endpoints correlating in the same direction. Um, so that's what comes to mind. But would welcome other thoughts. I mean, the short answer is no. You don't have to use the same um, surrogate. It, it really depends on what your, on your particular therapy and and what fits best with what your, your therapy is. I mean, that was a very loaded question, so it's hard to sort of, you know, generalize, but I think that the, the short answer is no, you're not bound to the exact same endpoint as, as what someone else did in a particular disease, but um, you have to be able to, you know, make the argument that what you are wanting to use is, um, is reasonably likely to predict benefit. Yeah. Clear answer is a rare thing in a panel discussion on a podium. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that one was uh, easy. Thank, thank you for the question. And you know, uh, going back to Dr. Burdan's uh, closing statements, um, and also what AB built on, you know, have, have options, have a primary and a secondary. Mm -hmm. um, and where there is precedent, there's a lot to see there. And with that, I'll thank everyone uh, for your engagement. Thank, very thankful to the panelists for taking out your time to engage in this conversation and very thankful to ARM for the opportunity to chair and moderate this session and enjoy lunch. Thank you. <laughs>